Thanks. after that big dinner. So let's see, let me look up sleeping in the Bible. Maybe we can come up with a kind of a sermon on sleeping, right? Yeah. Make it not so gray out. Yeah. Well, I'm sure looking forward to some sunny days. Well, when the boys get finished with the back door, they will uh, we'll start. So I uh, I was in Montana this morning, Seattle at noon, and now I'm here just to be here with you. Yeah, yeah. I missed you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Well, let's pray. So, Father in heaven, we come before you humbly, asking you, Lord God, to bless your word to us, that we might bless you with our faith. We ask that, Lord God, you give us the spirit of wisdom, discretion, understanding, and knowledge, that you forgive us for our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord, that you just help us to, to learn of you, study you, and do whatever your word says for us to do. And we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me read a scripture to you, okay? I, as I read the scripture, I thought this is a great scripture for Sunday, but I'm going to read it to you anyway, okay? I might use it for Sunday, just so you know. It says this, I'm in Acts 2, 22. And I won't be there long, but um, this is what the scripture says. Men of Israel, okay, so this is Peter addressing the crowd that, uh, that was um, assembled at Pentecost there. And we know that it was a big crowd because the Bible says 3,000 people became saved, which is pretty amazing. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by you, or by God, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now put yourself in the place of the people listening to this. This man, speaking of Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Wow. This man was handed over to you, to you that I'm speaking to, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on him. Now let me read you another scripture and then I want us to look at combining the two, okay? So I'm in Matthew chapter 26 and this is a passage of scripture that's familiar to all of you. I'll let you get there. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 36, if you want to get there. Now, remember what I just read to you, okay? I just read that Peter addressed this crowd of Jews. And he said that this man, Jesus Christ, was by God's foreknowledge and determination was handed over to you, and you killed him. But death could not hold him, okay? So that's what we're comparing. So Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, says this. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, you know that that's uh, John and his brother James, 
along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now listen to this. Think about this. Put yourself in Jesus' place now. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That's pretty overwhelming, isn't it? This is Jesus Christ talking. My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. But talk about being alone in the world. Huh? Jesus was very alone at this point. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then in verse 42 it says, He, speaking of Jesus, went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Now it's interesting, if you compare the two, if you compare verse 39 with what we just read, he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, right, may this cup be taken away. And in verse 42, he says, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away. So, my question to you tonight is, how hard do you think it is, or how easy do you think it is to know the will of God? That's what I want to, you to think about tonight. How hard is it, or how easy is it to know the will of God? Here, we just read Peter in Acts chapter 2. He said, Jesus was handed over to you by God's foreknowledge and will. Okay? Now, do you think Jesus knew that? I mean, I think he knew that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. But yet, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he pray? Father, if it would be possible for me not to have to drink this cup, that'd be great. So he knew what God's will was, right? But he prayed, Lord, if it was possible for this not to be your will or for something else to happen, then that would be, that'd be good. So how hard is it? To, Jesus knew the will of God, and he, but he was, he was obviously struggling there, wasn't he? I mean, he says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Have you ever, ever has anybody here ever been overwhelmed to the point of death? Now, I'm, I'm thinking that probably people get so overwhelmed that they think about committing suicide, okay? And people do that. They get so overwhelmed that they, that's exactly what they do. But here Jesus knew, he knew what was going to happen. I mean... It was it's written in the prophets. He knew the prophecies of the Bible. So, how many of you think it's hard to know God's will? Okay? Okay? How many of you think it's easy to know God's will? How many of you think it's both? Uh -huh. It's kind of both, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so here we've got this example of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and he was struggling in, in some way, knowing what God's will is, but having, yeah, I mean, I'm sure he wanted to do God's will. In fact, it says in, let me read, let me read it to you. It says in uh, Psalm chapter 40, verse 8, listen, it says, I desire to do your will, O God. Your law is within my heart. I think that that was a prophecy of what Jesus Christ was thinking. I desire to do your will, but your, and your law is within my heart. So, you know, here in life, we want to do God's will as, as Christians. If you do God's will, you'll stay out of trouble. Okay? And if you don't do God's will, you are bargaining for trouble. And I think all of us can identify with something in our life, you know, uh, here maybe you're making a business decision, okay, and, 
And Lord, I want to do your will. Uh, maybe you're making a relational decision. Lord, I want to do your will. Or um, what school to put your kids in? Or what house to buy? Or I mean, there's a hundred different decisions for a hundred different people, isn't there? So it's really important for us to know how to observe and how to figure out what God's will is. So I'm going to read a scripture to you. You, you don't you have to turn there, but just listen to the scriptures. And, and you all know it. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. Okay? Now listen to what God says. For I know the plans I have for you. Okay? Declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's a pretty good promise. So he doesn't want us to be harmed. He wants us to prosper. I think maybe your, your uh, name and claim it people probably take that as, as monetary prospering. I don't think that that's a very accurate way to look at it because um, I, I wrote down I wrote down uh, from uh, Big Sky, Montana today to Bozeman. That's about a, oh, about an hour and 10 minute ride if, if the roads are all right. And this guy, he never talk, stopped talking. <laughs> oh my God, 61 years old. He's been doing this for a living for 15 years. He drives rich people, poor people, all kinds of people. And he never stopped talking once. <laughs> hour and about 15 minutes. And you know what he said? He said, I am really a rich person. I'm really rich. And I thought to myself, you know, that's a pretty good attitude. I'm really rich. He wasn't rich monetarily. I mean, you could tell that. Either that or he was, he was putting on a really good front. One of the two, okay? You know. Uh, but we are really, really rich. And God has plans to prosper us. And to me, the, the best prosperity you could have is to know the Lord in your heart and to be growing in Him and to be doing whatever He wants you to do. You see, I'm going to read a scripture to you that I'm kind of I'm kind of hopping around, but you can go back and look at these scriptures when you get an extra minute. It's in John, 1 John chapter 2. And let me find it. Here's what it says, okay? 1 John chapter 2, and starting at verse 4 down to verse 6. So let me read it to you. This is John speaking, same, same John that wrote the book of Revelation. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Now think about that. We know, okay, we know experientially that we have come to know him. Now, the subject here is, um, is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. So, he's talking about coming to know God. The man, the man who says, I know him. I said, where did I start? Three. I started where? Three. Three. Okay, thank you. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, in other words, does what? Does God's will, right? God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Okay. So, my interpretation for myself is this. Lord, help me to obey you so I can prove that I love you. Because that's the proof of the pudding, isn't it? <coughs> if you obey, because it says right here, if uh, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. You know, and, and what's the first and greatest commandment that's been given to us? Yeah, love the Lord with all your heart. Okay, so that would be your emotions. 
with your soul, okay, that's the inner part of you, okay, with your mind, that's your thinking, and with your strength, that is your physical body. You know, love the Lord with your physical body, too. That's why you don't do the things that the Lord tells you not to do, okay? So, doing God's will, I think, is this. God's will is outlined for us pretty thoroughly in the Bible. Now, God doesn't outline here, uh, you should marry Roger because he's a great guy. Okay? Whoever Roger is. Uh, <laughs> I hope I didn't step on anybody's toes here. <laughs> we don't have any Rogers here, do we? <laughs> you know, there's certain things, or, I, you know, should I take that trip, Lord? Or should I do this? There's certain things that you have to learn by a progression of what the Word says, the circumstances that develop around whatever you're, you're questioning, whatever you're trying to figure out, and, uh, and the peace that God gives you in your heart. What does it say? He will give you the peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. So, I think that it's easy in some ways to know God's will. All you got to do is read the Bible. Okay? And we'll do some of that tonight. And then it's hard to know God's will when it comes to sometimes individual types of circumstances that, you know, you, you just don't want to mess up and, and do the wrong thing. So, all right. Jesus said, you don't have to turn there, in John 4, 34. Listen to what he says. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He said, that's my food. That's what I survive on. I'm going to read you a scripture out of Philippians here um, that kind of goes along with this. Again, I'm flipping around a little bit, but listen to this, okay? So what did Jesus just say? Jesus just said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now listen to what God says to us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, down to verse 6. Listen. It says this. This is Paul speaking. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. Speaking to the church at Philippi. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Then he says, being confident. Now this is a this word in the Greek has a has it's it's a it's a deep confidence says of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So let's let's draw some conclusions here. All right, we have already seen that he that obeys the love of the the word of God. Okay. The love of God is made perfect in him. Now that helps us to obey the first and the second commandment, okay? Loving God with all your heart, etc., and loving your neighbor as yourself. And those are two commandments that are can be hard to, especially the neighbor part, I think. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shut that dog up! <laughs> I know none of you can identify with that, right? yeah. So Now, you don't have to turn there, but Proverbs 29, 18 says this. Without a vision, the people perish. So then, what, and I'm asking each one of you this, not to raise your hand and give me an answer, but just to think about it for yourself. What is your vision for yourself? What is your vision for your life? Okay. There's a lot of Christians running around. We won't even talk about non-Christians because their vision is, we know what their vision is, right? But there's a lot of Christians that are playing Christianity. They just are. Now, they may be saved. The Bible says that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, you will be saved. If you're born again, you don't get unborn. That's, that, that is God's grace. 
Okay, that's God's grace, totally. But there's a lot of Christians who are born again, but they really never do much with it. So what is their vision? Their vision has to be a worldly vision, isn't it? Basically. Let me read another scripture to you. 1 John, and I think it's in chapter, let me see. I'm doing this kind of from memory, so bear with me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Now this is not a suggestion, okay? This is in the imperative mood in the Greek, which indicates it's a command. Listen to what it says. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Is that pretty clear? Do not love the world. Now that doesn't mean that when I take a drive and I see the beautiful trees or a river or God's creation, that doesn't mean that I, I don't appreciate it to the point of actually loving to be out in the woods or whatever, right? It just means that that's not my priority. Okay, that's not my priority in life. That's not my vision. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, okay, here's another one of those formulas. The love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I mean, that's a very sobering thought if you think about it. Because if you're a a worldly person, a world, especially a worldly Christian, this says if you're in love with the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That's serious to me. I mean, I, I want to love God. I mean, that's that's the first and greatest command. If you don't do that, what's what's good with the rest of them? You know, that's that's the first one. It says for everything in the world. That doesn't say almost everything. It says, for everything in the world, the, now listen things, the craving of sinful man. Okay? There goes my, um, there goes my chocolate peanut butter ice cream. Okay? The lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So now we have the will of God in there again. So that is, that's, that's just an amazing scripture. So, can we know God's will? Absolutely. You know, in Psalm 143.10, it says this, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God, May your good spirit lead me on level ground. You know, life is full of hills and valleys and mountains and all kinds of stuff that you got to go across. And I've always thought about this. Think about this. And, and I'm a skier, so this, this is especially pertinent. A mountaintop experience is really pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, it really is. The view... I mean, the, the, the dynamics of it and everything. But what grows on a mountaintop? Nothing. Not much. Right? Maybe a few scrub brushes or something like that. But you don't find real big tall trees on a tall mountain. Where does things grow? In the valley. What did the Psalm... Is it Psalm 22? 23? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yeah. You know, the valley is where things grow. The mountaintop is where we get that experience of, of the emotions and everything else. And we're just so happy to know God. But in the mountaintop, you know, there's, there's rototilling and all the rest of the stuff. And, and some of that stuff is kind of painful, to be honest with you. But don't despise the valley. Don't despise the mountaintop either, but don't despise the valley. So without a vision, the people perish. So we need to determine what is our vision. Romans, and you're welcome to turn there if you want to. 
Romans chapter 12 kind of gives us, in my view, a pretty good idea of what a vision should be. Okay? I'll wait till you get there. Romans chapter 12. I use this every day. I pray this every day to the Lord. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Um, I'm reading out of the New International. It says, therefore, therefore. So, therefore is therefore a reason. What is therefore, therefore? Well, if you look at chapter 11, in verse 33, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore. Therefore, because God is so amazing, I urge you, brothers, he's speaking to Christians here, in view of God's mercy. So what is God's mercy? Okay, Mercy and grace are two different things. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve separation. We deserve judgment. We deserve condemnation and, 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 and separation from God forever because of our sins. I mean, that's just the way it is. God could have very easily just told Adam and Eve, heck with you. I'm going to start all over. I'm going to leave you on this earth. You can go ahead and procreate all you want to, but you're all going to hell. He didn't do that. In Genesis 3.15, so right after they sin, he provides the gospel. The first mention of the gospel is in Genesis 3.15. Isn't that amazing that in John 3.15 we have the gospel mentioned there too? So, in view of God's mercy, in view of the fact that He's not giving us what we deserve. Now, I like to, in my prayers, I like to add in view of God's grace and mercy. Because what's grace? Yeah. Grace gives us something we don't deserve. Right? He gives us eternal life when we believe in Him. He gives us a plan to prosper us, not to harm us. We've already read that. He gives us intuition, wisdom. He gives us uh, blessings in this life to be uh, continued in the next life. So in view of God's grace and mercy, I'm going to add to the Word of God here. I hope it's okay, boys. Okay? He says this, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. What does that mean? That means that you as a living person, an alive person, not a dead cow, not a dead bull, not a dead goat, not a dead pigeon or a turtle dove or anything else that God says, I don't delight in those sacrifices. But I can tell you this, He delights in this. He does. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. I add, before the word holy, I add the word made. Made holy. Made holy and pleasing to God by the life and death of Jesus Christ. Right? I want to make sure God knows that I know. <laughs> You know, I don't want any, any mistakes here. He says this, Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Okay, let's, let's start with that. This is your spiritual act of worship. You want to worship God? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Lord, take me. I'm alive. I got a mouth, I got ears, I got a brain, I got a heart, I got some money, I got, I, you know, use me, whatever. However you want to use me, just use me, okay? He says this, and I love the way the King James says it. 
He says, it is your reasonable service. How reasonable is it that in view of God's mercy, he did not give you what you deserve? How reasonable is that, if you want to reason together, that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice? I didn't get what I deserved, i.e. hell. I think it's a pretty reasonable trade myself. I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice, Lord, because you didn't condemn me to hell. That's reasonable. Yeah. Now, he echoes what John says here. He says, do not conform any longer. Okay, so at one time we did conform to the pattern of this world. He says, but, here's your contrast, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Hmm? The Bible says let the water of the word renew your mind. Yeah. Prayer, okay, is the exhale of faith. Reading the word is the inhale of faith. If you're praying and you're reading the word, you're breathing properly and you're a healthy person. Especially if you're doing it every day. Or more than one time a day. He says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, then, not before that, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Hmm. Okay, Lord, well, wow. Lord, I don't know whether or not to make that investment. So, I'm offering my mind, my body, my soul, my spirit to you as a living sacrifice because it says in your word, then, if I'm not conformed to the pattern of this world, then I'll be able to know what your will is. Alright? So, do not be afraid to bargain with God. Okay? I mean... I'm saying that respectfully. Come, let us reason together, the Bible says. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. God reasons with us, and I reason with God all the time. Why? Because He knows everything, and I don't know a whole lot of things. So I'd rather have His knowledge than trying to figure it out myself. He says, and that, that kind of goes along with the next verse. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in, court, in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. All right, so God is not hiding his will from us. He wants to reveal his will to us. I mean, like, a parent, you know, you wouldn't, if your kid came in the kitchen and the stove was hot, you wouldn't say, <laughs> I'm just going to let him do his thing, man. We'll see if he burns himself or not, you know, whatever. No. You say, Johnny, or Mary, or whatever, the stove is hot. Don't touch it. It will burn you. Now, if Mary touches the stove, it's kind of on Mary, isn't it? Not on you. You warned him. You warned her. See, last summer was kind of very, something happened to us that was very exciting for me because we were planning this situation and three times we had a block put in our path and it ended up that we didn't do what we were going to do because there was a very good reason for that. And I, it was exciting to me to know that actually the Lord had tried three to make us understand that we weren't going to do this certain thing. And we ended up not doing it, and then we found out why, and it was good. Yeah, that's and awesome. And so that, well, that hasn't happened to me very often, but I knew mm -hmm. that God was in total control of that. Yeah, and you know, it says in Revelation chapter 3, I believe it was speaking to the church of Philadelphia, he says, when God opens a door, no man can close it. And when God closes a door, no man can open it. So you pray for the open door or the closed door. And you know what? You never kick the door down. You let God open it if, if that's what he wants you to do. So, I think our will is more God's will. 
Say that again. Our will be done the way of God. Will yeah, sometimes. yeah and, and when I pray, I say, Lord, I want my will to be your will. Exactly. And then I have to think, now I didn't mean that, that I want my will right. to be what you want. Okay, I want my will to be what you want. <laughs> kind of a tongue, tongue twister on that one, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So let me read something to you, and you you can either turn to it or not. And it's Hebrews chapter 13. And let's see what the old book of Hebrews talks about. How many of you have studied, done a, a, a deeper study of the book of Hebrews? Okay. Anybody else? Hebrews? Yes, it's an amazing book. Okay, Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 15. Hebrews 13, 15. Yeah, here's what it says. Through Jesus, and this kind of goes right along with, with Romans chapter 12, my friends. Listen to this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that confess his name and do not forget to do good and share with others for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So the first thing we do is we offer ourselves as living sacrifices. We don't conform to the pattern of this world. We renew our mind, okay, according to 1 John, and now let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and see what Paul's got to say to the church of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to be in verse 22. Ooh. Yeah, this is good. Okay, this is good. So, in the, in the Bible, all right, there are positive things about knowing the will of God, like obeying Him, and learning to love Him, and, and uh, praising Him. We just read, you know, a sacrifice of praise. But there's also negative things. Don't do certain things, okay? Don't conform to the pattern of the world. Let's see what Paul says to the uh, church at Ephesus, starting in verse 22, okay? And we'll read all the way through till uh, 521. He says this, You were taught... Okay, so this is past tense. You were taught with regard to your former way of life. That would be a worldly way of life. To put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And to be made new in the attitude of your minds. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is, he's using the example really of, I mean, I'm looking at this as like clothing, you know. Take off the worldly clothing and put on the spiritual clothing, okay. Now he gives us some examples here. And these should probably be underlined. He says in verse 25, therefore. Okay, so why is there, therefore, or therefore there? Well, because we're supposed to put off the old self and put on the new self. Therefore. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So in other words, don't lie. In your anger, here's another thought, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, a lot of people apply that to marriage, and that is a good application for sure. But, you know, think about the other times when, you know, I, I, on television, I watch a show called Road Rage. You ever watch that? Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's embarrassing. It really is. It's embarrassing to see what people do. Just, yeah. And the embarrassing part is that sometimes I get road rage, and I'm going to have to stop that. That's really embarrassing. He says, 
In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. That speaks to me saying, if I get angry, I'm giving the devil a foothold. Because anger can lead to what? You know, anger can lead to a lot of different things. It says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. On the plane ride today, I had a couple of uh, bars, you know, protein bars in my pocket. And I was sitting next to a, a gal, and I reached out on the protein bars, and I'm eating on it, and I, and I thought to myself, should I have offered this to her first? You know, I, am I being selfish by eating a protein bar, and she's got no protein bars over there, you know? So, anyway, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his hands. Why? That he may have something to share with those in need. Oh, here's another one. Do not let any unwholesome chop talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Wow, there's a lot of people, probably including myself, who can listen to that one, huh? He says this, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Now we've got a positive note. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. You know, it's interesting. I, I actually have met a few people that just flat out are not forgiving. They're not forgiving people. They hold a grudge and uh, they'll, they'll bring up that, that event that caused that grudge years down the road. You know, and they're Christians. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, the Bible says if you don't forgive... Why should God forgive you? You know, we have to be forgiving people. People are people. If it wasn't for people, the church would be a great place. You know what I mean? I mean, there'd be no problems whatsoever. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> we're not, you see, we're not um, forgiving somebody else um, for them. We're forgiving them because that's what God wants us to do. It's better our walk. Absolutely, and, and, and it is for them too, though, because well, if, for, first of all, I think, first of all, I think it's for God. Secondly, I think it's to, to clear your heart of any animosity or anger. And then thirdly, it's, it's to try to restore a friendship or a relationship of some kind that, that you may have, uh, may have been destroyed. You certainly do not. No. But you know what? It's like in Jeremiah, it says, you know, the watchman on the wall, if he sees the sword coming and he tells everybody, their blood is on their heads. But if he, does, if he sees the sword coming and he doesn't tell them, then their blood is on his hands. So, yeah. All right, so it says here in chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God. Now, all these things we've been reading, do not let any wholesome talk come out of your mouths, etc. These are all not, these are not suggestions. Okay? The ten great suggestions. No, these are, these are imperative mood, they are commandments. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That brings me back to Romans chapter 12 where it says, in view of God's mercy, 
offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. That's what Jesus did. It says, but among you there must not be. And every time there's a word must, I always circle it. Or, well, actually square it, but you must not, e there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Why? Well, because these are improper for God's holy people. He doesn't stop there. Nor should, should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For the... For of this you can be sure. Now when the apostle says you can be sure of this, probably ought to have it underlined. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. You know, somebody comes up to me and wants to tell me a joke. I just tell them, you know, I really don't have time to listen. I, the chances of it being something that's going to build me up are pretty slim. Now, the one joke about the blonde was really good, though. You know, <laughs> why was the blonde staring at the orange juice, the frozen orange juice container? Because it's concentrate. Concentrate. That's right. <laughs> oh, you got me on that one, didn't you? Okay. Poor blondes. <laughs> Sorry, blondes. <laughs> so we go on. He says this in verse 8. I'm in Ephesians 5 8. For you were once darkness. Yeah, one time in, you were non Christian. But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord find out what God's will is remember what it said in, uh, in uh, Romans 12 1 then you will know okay after you have stopped conforming to the world after you have offered your bodies as a living sacrifice it says then you will know what God's perfect and pleasing will is it says this for you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Okay, any of you who are sleeping, listen. <laughs> Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You know, sometimes you can, you can use a little bit of friendly sarcasm to get to somebody. When I was playing a lot of racquetball, uh, a lot of times we'd have four in the court. We'd play partners, right? And somebody would make just a lousy shot or something, they would use the name of the Lord in vain. They would say Jesus Christ. Now, you know, when you hear the phrase God damn, mm -hmm. that hurts. But when you hear somebody say Jesus Christ in a very ill-mannered way, that really hurts. And I would just stop and I'd say, I didn't know you knew the Lord. And they would be like so embarrassed. They, why would you say that? I said, well, because you're using the Lord's name. You know, they wouldn't do it around me after that. I can tell you that. So it says in verse 15, this is, I've got this underlined, yellowed, everything. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Why? making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Man, if they were evil when Paul was writing this. This certainly applies to today, doesn't it? He says, therefore do not be foolish, 
but understand what the Lord's will is. Now he's going to tell us what the Lord's will is and what the Lord's will isn't. The Lord's will isn't, verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, instead be filled with the Spirit. Here's another one. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that passage reminds me of one in Thessalonians. Let me find it and then I'll keep turn to it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, okay? And you're welcome to, you're welcome to turn to it. 1 Thessalonians 5, and I'll start at verse 12, okay? I'll wait till you get there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. This is Paul speaking to the church at Thessalon Thessalonica. Now we ask you brothers, so he's speaking to brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. These are not suggestions. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Wow, that's pretty plain, huh? God's will is for us to be thankful. God's will is for us to be, be in constant communication with Him. You know, and it says, be thankful in all circumstances. That's hard. That's really, really hard. And you know, I think that the more we practice that, okay, Lord, I was late for that meeting, but thank you that I didn't get in a wreck. Um, we were driving up to the mountain the uh, day before yesterday, and there was a it, snow on the road up to, in Montana, to uh, Big Sky. And a red pickup truck had slid into the lane of a 18-wheeler coming the other way. Head-on collision. You know, and I mean, traffic was backed up and blah, 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 blah. And we were waiting to get to the ski area and everything, and I, I just told my son, I said, you know what? Those people are having a bad day. That's a bad day. We should be thankful that, and we should pray for them that nobody was hurt, and fortunately nobody died. Yeah, nobody was hurt. Yeah, nobody was hurt. The, the, the truck was, the truck front was smashed, and the, the uh, engine of the, of the smaller truck was pushed all the way back, but yeah. I mean, they got, I didn't see an ambulance, so that was a good thing. But we got there right after the accident happened, so. So we should be thankful in all circumstances, okay? He says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat, treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good and avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you or set you apart through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. So we want to, God's not hiding his will for, from us. He wants to reveal it. He's got a good plan. We're to offer ourselves living sacrifices. We're not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. We're to renew our mind, as it said in Ephesians. And in Philippians chapter 2, 5, you don't have to turn to it. It says this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, we have the Spirit of God living in us. The same exact Spirit of God that Jesus Christ 
lived his life on the face of the earth through. So we have the mind of Christ, and this, this what we've got in front of us here is the instruction manual. And men, I'll tell you, most men don't, do not like to use an instruction manual. I know I'm one of them, okay? That's right. You know, and the problem is, is that when you don't read the instruction manual, a lot of times you'll have parts left over that really shouldn't be left over, right? When you put something together. So you're always better reading the instruction manual, and this is the instruction manual of God. So what do we do? We pray according to God's will. Let me read something to you out of 1 John. Okay. I mean, and I'm just going to do this quick. First John chapter five, verse thirteen. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here, isn't there? Yes. There's a lot of stuff in here about not doing the wrong thing and about doing the right thing. First John chapter five, starting with verse thirteen, says this. This is awesome. He says, John says. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And God wants us to know. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Okay, so first of all, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we will have what we ask of Him. How do we know that? Because if we're praying according to His will, then His will says, I'm going to let that happen. Right? That's, that's just amazing. Another thing that we need to, second thing to do is, the first thing is pray according to God's will. The second thing is to know God's Word. Let me read some things to you. 2 Timothy, you don't have to turn there, 3.16 says this. It says that all Scripture, okay, that includes the book of Leviticus, Numbers, the books that many people consider boring but actually are very interesting once you get to know them. He says this, all Scripture is God-breathed. It's the breath of God. And is useful for one, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So what's going to be the result? So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you know this, you're putting tools in your belt. And whatever job comes in front of you, okay, you're going to have the right tool for that job. It says in the Bible, it says, uh, well, I'll, I'll read it to you here. It's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. And that's today. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry, and every one of us has a ministry. That's a fact. And I have watched some stuff on YouTube, um, you can, you know, you can uh, check it out for yourself. You know, they'll have, uh, you know, churches that are, or preachers that are not speaking the word of God. They're just doing all kinds of weird stuff. And boy, that this verse in Timothy fits right along, just like a glove, with those people. Let me read another one to you. It's Second Timothy two fifteen. Let's see what that one says. Ah, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed and who cor correctly handles the word of truth. 
And he goes on, he says, avoid godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. How would you like to have your name written in the Word of God that lasts forever in a negative note? Not good, huh? No. He says this, Who have wandered away from the truth, they say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Or I wouldn't want to be Hymenaeus or the other guy. That's for sure. Now here's one, and we're, we're almost done. Another hour or two will be done. In James chapter 1, verse 19, this is, so our first thing we want to notice is pray according to God's will, right? The second thing is to learn the Word of God. We just read that. The third thing is to do the Word of God. That's God's will. Listen to what James chapter 1, verse 19 says. And I'll probably read down to, oh, I'll read down a little bit down there. My dear brothers, so he's writing to Christians, take note of this. Take notes. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save me. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Pretty plain. To the point. Right there. We already read um, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. We're to walk as Jesus did. Okay? How did Jesus walk? Well, he walked in love. He walked in hope. A confidence. He had integrity. Honesty. Humility. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And then be joyful and be thankful. Uh, and we read that out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it said, Be thankful in all circumstances, etc. Well, let's see if there's anything else we want to get. Oh, I, okay, I've got this whole list here that I... No, I'm just kidding. We, we're we done. So, in conclusion... Yes? You need to read one more book, like Ephesians 5.21. You need to read one more book. Okay, Ephesians 5.21. I can do that. Hold on. 322, I think that's what we should do. 22, okay. Ephesians? Oh, this. All right, let me see. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something about wives submitting to husbands. Of course, of course the, the verse before it, verse 21 says, submit to one another. Now, the guys always forget that. Okay. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I have done a couple of weddings where the bride has said, I, I don't want you to mention anything about the submission thing, okay? I'm serious. Yeah. And you know what? I in looking at, at looking at at least one or two of those marriages that, you know, uh, are still in force, you can see where that not submitting to one another really causes problems. I mean, you know, it's it's not a 50-50 proposition. It's a 100-100 proposition. And if hubby can't give 100%, wifey's got to give 125. If wifey can only give 60%, then hubby's got to give 140. And that's the way it works out. It always adds up to 200%. Okay, 100 for each one of you. So, in conclusion, what have you learned tonight? Anything? Well, I know what I want. Okay, speak loud. I want to, I've been in the Old Testament. I want to get back into Paul's letters. I just, wow. Yeah. I mean, what a way to balance you out, especially in these days that we're living in. There's, there's a wealth of riches yes. in the scriptures, isn't there? Yes. And, you know, we just forget. Mm -hmm. You know, we get busy, we forget, you know, 
about this scripture or that scripture because we haven't read it for a while. So just sometimes just reading random scriptures is, is really good. So, yes. I've got some. Okay. okay. We're talking about husband, you know, wives being submissive to husbands and everything, right? Oh, boy. Okay. Galatians 25. Galatians 25. You can read it. It tells us, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So, yeah, we can be submissive to one another and stuff. But it also tells us that our husbands are supposed to warn us, be protecting us as Jesus Christ protects our church. Absolutely. He's the head of our house. Yep. And he needs to be protecting us underneath. Well, and I've always said that women let men think they're in control. Okay? <laughs> but in actuality, they're really in control. Okay? Uh, they just are. So, well, let's, do, let's all do the will of God. Okay, let's find out what God's will is for us. Let's have a vision of what God might have for us. He says, I've got a plan for you. It's not to harm you, it's to prosper you. So God has a plan that he has set in motion for each one of us. That doesn't mean that we don't sometimes veer off that plan. But if we really are seeking God's will, we'll come back. We'll get back on track to the plan whatever that plan is for each one of us. So pray for this Sunday service. There probably will be, there may be a, a lot of people who come just as visitors. There usually is on Easter. So um, we'll hope that uh, it's a message that uh, causes people to give their lives to Christ. So let's pray. Yes. Also for Patty. Patty, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Randy, her husband, died uh, Monday night. You remember Man, uh, Randy? He was he came up and sang uh, a song that was kind of in a way to his wife about the rose. Yeah, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day uh, older man played the piano. Very very yeah. Very very um, very talented for sure. And he just he just died sitting in his favorite chair. Yes, sir. His wife wife found him. So I mean that's a happy occasion that he didn't suffer. Uh, but we do need to hold up Patty for sure. Yeah. So Father in heaven, we do exactly that. We hold up Patty to you. We, we know that Randy's in heaven with you and he's rejoicing. We just pray that you'll strengthen Patty, help her to grieve properly, Lord God, and, and to just depend upon you and know that you're in control of her life and, and that you were uh, uh, gracious to Randy and to take him the way you did. And Father, we pray for Sunday service that you'll bring as many people as you want to come uh, to hear your word. We just pray for the music and the musicians, the teaching, the teachers, and all the students, Lord. And we give this all to you. And we thank you, Lord. Help us to do your will, Lord. Help us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you, made holy and acceptable by Jesus Christ, because it's reasonable for us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good to be back with you. Happy well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I want you to make. Is it really 815? No. What is it? 858. Oh, okay. 758. Hey, I want you to make a note. Two minutes. Two minutes early? Yeah. I'm changing. I don't know what to say, actually.